Hey guys, welcome back. Um, I know it's been a while since I posted my last video, like maybe a year or two years now. Sorry about that, that's just, I just got busy and in general this is just kind of a channel when I have time I'm gonna put this stuff out there, but I'm not going to be a typical YouTuber that's posting like three times a week. I just don't have time for that. The video production company luckily has been on an upward trajectory since 2020. Um, so getting a decent amount of business there, which is great. And then on my own personal side, um, in the area I've kind of started to garner a reputation as a cinematographer, or director of photography. So I've worked on a couple documentaries and recently, this past fall, just shot my first feature film, uh, fiction feature film called Cuisine de l'Apocalypse, which is where this hat's from. You know me and hats, I'm always gonna have a hat on. Um, but I'm not bald. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that was great. Um, it was some friends of mine I actually went to college with um, here in Montana, and uh, he just really hustled hard, came out with a series. Um, it's pretty awesome what he managed to pull off. and. Um, managed to get the funds to make the film. And then I was, he honored me by uh, inviting me to come shoot it, which was um, super awesome and unexpected. But um, it was great that he, uh, he kept it all local crew, which I think is really cool, as best he could anyway. And um, it meant a lot to me that he trusted me with his film. So hopefully that'll turn out well. But if you guys are ever interested, I could, I'd totally be willing to talk to you about that experience. like. I think there's a video in line there. But this film is about the Pocket 6K camera again. My updated rig, because a lot's changed. It was working for me well at the time, but I've made a lot of changes because there was a lot of downfall on that rig. So I was like, okay, I need to come out with another video just to show you where this rig's at. And I'll link that video in the description so if you're confused about something, it's there. Now this rig obviously is gonna be more expensive. Um, there's things on here that aren't necessary for every shooter, but they were for me as I've grown. Um, so yeah, let's just jump in. gonna talk about the rig I'm not gonna take it apart because I have it rigged out in a way that works for me um, and if I take it apart then I have to reorient things you know it's just it just be kind of a pain and I just keep the camera in a um, camera coffin without the lens on obviously so I will show you each piece in detail throughout the, this video but we'll be talking about it in this form as it goes so as we all know, the base camera is Pocket 6K. It's still been working great for me. I've had it for, since 2020, so, what is that? Almost three years now, two years. Uh, I think it's a great camera. The first big change was before I had it on a 15 millimeter rail block by like either Nitsi or Small Rig. And that was fine, except since it wasn't designed for this cage and this setup, the if I mounted like a mat box or something to the rails or really anything to the rails, they weren't perfectly in line with the lens. They were like, if this was the lens, they were off just a little bit. So I have since switched to um, Tilta's rail block. The camera kind of slides in from the side. Um, that's the release system. Part of the rail box switch, besides just getting those rails more in line, is that this rail block can use RE dovetails. You can mount it to like a Manfrotto plate and then it'll allow you to shift where the camera's weight is. So as you add lenses or filters or anything, you can balance the camera out very quickly on top of the tripod head so that the rig is balanced on the head. And you're not having it swing forward or swing back. It's very common to use dovetails for that reason and they're just really awesome. I will say this though. In the future, I love Tilta's cage system. I think it's great. But the thing I hate, it's all proprietary. 
Um, and what I mean by that is they even went as far as making their dovetails proprietary. I don't know why you would do that, besides the fact that they're trying to really force their customers to buy their specific dovetails, which I don't like. And I'm, I never, I don't really use a gimbal anymore. I just, not at least with this camera, I think at this point, if I was going to use a gimbal just for time's sake, I would mount like something like a, like a Canon, um, what is it? A Canon, like the new, uh, the new full frame Canons or like, you know, just one of those mirrorless cameras. I would just mount something like that on the gimbal and leave it on there for the entire shoot and not take it off. Just because balancing takes time um, and to take this out of this whole ecosystem, put it on a gimbal and then put it back in the ecosystem would, would take a very long time. Also, generally my clients just tend to like the handheld look and we're shooting in 6K, um, downscaling to 4K. So there's room for cropping and stabilization. And I kind of shoot in a documentary style. So um, we're not always staging stuff. And because of that, it just makes sense. So switch the rail block up. Um, battery plate and everything is the same from the other rig, but pocket 6K, tilt to camera cage, the full cage with the tilt to top handle um, and the SSD holder. In the SSD holder, we have a Samsung T5. Um, I still use those. They work great for me and they're awesome. The cage is still great. Um, obviously, working with something like this compared to like if you're using an Ari Alexa or a RED or Sony Venice or something that has a lot more real estate, you're gonna run out of quarter 20s eventually. So that's the basis um, up top for monitor. We still have the port keys, um, five inch monitor. And I was running into issues using the small rig um, friction arm, mostly because maybe I don't, I'm kind of forceful with the monitor sometimes trying to get it so I can see in a certain angle. Um, so it just was loosening up on me a lot. Uh, I wanted something a little more robust, so I went with this Condor, um, I guess you'd call it like a, a ball arm. Um, it's been awesome, Condor Blue. Um, the only downside is you don't have as much like room to move it. It kind of gets stopped in certain places, but uh, that's been great. The port keys, I still highly recommend. I love this monitor. I used it on the feature too, on an Alexa, on Ari Alexa Mini. Um, and it was great. It lasted the whole shoot, 12 to 15 hour days um, for like a month. It's just, it's just an awesome monitor. Um, it's been with me from the get go and I just, I love it. Um, with, and I currently still have the Bluetooth module to connect to the camera so that I can control my settings from up here. And it has all of the settings you need. It has focus assist, peaking and zebras and false color and waveforms. So definitely recommend that. I switched up two major things. So before I was using this grip here and I would have it kind of mounted on the side and I would hold on to the other side of the camera and I'd pull focus with this grip. And I was using a Nucleus Nano. I still think the Nucleus Nano is a great follow focus. Um, particularly if you're gonna be focusing yourself. Um, I think it's great. And I still think this hand grip's awesome. So I've kept it. But um, I got spoiled on the feature and had a focus puller. And I realized the benefit of having a dedicated focus puller and being able to have that um, relationship where you know, they're doing something creative and they have one very key job of keeping everything in focus. And then you're doing something creative, but your key job is to keep a nice stable shot and nice composition. When you're pulling your own focus, no matter how you're doing it, from the barrel, from a wheel, or even from a hand grip with your finger, it still takes your mind off of just composition and onto something else. And I felt as though at times you lose it. I still have no problem doing it. Um, this rig is set up to do it, but I have since switched my focus to the Nucleus M, 
which is kind of a more professional industry standard. It's definitely not like a WCU4 by RE or like a Teradek RT, but um, I've seen them on multiple professional shoots. So I switched to that and I love it. Um, it has, you know, a focus motor, zoom motor, and iris motor, which is great. Or you can get it with an iris motor. But what's also awesome is you can use the Nucleus Nano motor as any of those three motors. Um, so I have done that and I use it as an iris motor when we need that. But currently I just have it set up for focus. If you get the full kit, it comes with these control grips, which allow you to pull your own focus, control your own iris, and zoom all from those grips, but in a situation kind of like my old rig with the Nano to where if you're in a shoulder rig or something else, it's all in your hands so you can still control the camera well and be stable. You're not removing a hand just to spin a wheel, which is great. But since I got spoiled, um, you know, I, I have taught my assistant how to pull focus. He doesn't pull by looking over my shoulder. I've since gotten a wireless system. So the wireless system I'm running is um, the Teradek um, 4K 750 LTs. These are awesome. Um, really like these. Um, I've worked with a lot of Teradeks because um, I first AC'd a lot myself and second AC'd a lot. And I've been around all the older gen Teradeks, but this is my first time really working with the new stuff. Um, they're awesome. I used to have a lot of issues with Teradex. You know, they're always having wireless dropouts. I haven't had any issues with this yet, knock on wood. So I have that sending, you know, it's just a one-to-one -one setup right now. Hopefully it'll be one to two soon so I can have a monitor, you know, like one wireless monitor, which currently I'm using an OC 15 inch, the Megamon 15. I could have that set up as like a client monitor um, and then a standalone seven inch is what I currently have for uh, my assistant to pull focus. So this is great because he they can look over his shoulder, see what the image is, make sure they are happy. And um, yeah, no, these are, this has been a really awesome upgrade and I highly recommend it. The next big change was the map box. So before I had the Fotka DP500. Um, to be honest, I wish I didn't go that route, but it was cheap, so I did at the time because it was what I could afford. The reason I wish I didn't go up that route is I was using four x four filters, and sometimes I rent my equipment out to other people who need them, and um, nobody wants to rent four x four filters. So I have a kit of 4x4 filters that pretty much I'm the only one who will ever use them and I can't make any rental money off of them when I'm not using them. And nobody really wants to buy them because people want industry standard which is 4x565. So um, that was kind of one downside. The other downside is it wasn't a clip-on matte box. Now at the time I was still using photography lenses so that didn't matter. Um, I know now they make a lot of different matte boxes that will attach to photography lenses as clip-on and I recommend that you go with clip-on because I think it's quicker um, when you're switching lenses and um, it alleviates some rail space so you can put other accessories like these grips or you know right here I have a um, lens support you could put all your different motors, and especially on a small rig like that, you run out of rail space quick. So it's nice to have that. So I have since switched to the Tilta um, MB112 or MB112 clip-on matte box. Um, and this thing is freaking awesome. Again, I used this on the feature and I've used it on all those documentary shoots I've been on and commercial shoots. It's very rugged, it's awesome. I love it. I think it's a great matte box. You lose the side flags, but I very rarely use side flags. Um, it comes with a, gr a bunch of mats, and you know it comes with your eyebrow. Um, currently, just to show you guys, it's a three-stage mat box, um, and it is industry standard, so it has four x five, six five, and I currently have a four x five, six five ND filter in there just to show you. Um, it's awesome. It's really great. 
Um, the filters I use, if you're curious, I use some Tiffin stuff, primarily with like Promists. My own like ND filters are Nisi, IRND. Little tip that you'll learn is to just put Velcro on the side and put tags so that you know and just order them and which stage you put them in. But then that way when I'm shooting, I know what ND I have in, what filters I have in. Another big change, and I'll be talking about these lenses in detail. I have mixed feelings about them, mostly good. Um, are the cinematics, um, like rehoused Sigma zoom lenses. So before I was using the Sigma 18 to 35, which is what the GH4 is shooting on right now as a photo lens. Um, and I was getting really tired of having to log in my own infinity to close because it's fly on wheel. There's no hard stops. And I just wanted something more true to actual cinema with Mod 8 gears and hard stops and uh, de-clicked aperture because I find a lot of times mid-shoot I'll want to change my aperture because we're going from inside to outside or we go in from a lighter room to a darker room and I either have to cut and click, click through and have to cut that shift, that hard shift of aperture out. Um, and that, I just didn't enjoy that, it kind of sucked. So now that I have these, it's a de-clicked aperture, so it's smooth. These lenses are really great. Um, you're gonna need that, you're gonna need a lens support with them. They are heavier. You shouldn't use them without a lens support because it's gonna um, put a lot of stress on the flange of the camera, the lens mount. Um, and they're metal housing, so they're heavier which can be a good thing if you're doing a lot of handheld, um, which I am, um, because it, you know, the more weight, the more stable it can be. The more tired you get, the more stable it can be. Um, but I really like these lenses. Um, I think they're really, really pretty great. I think they did a good job on the housing. I have run into issues with them, mostly with like whip zooms. Um, when I would whip to the zoom, uh, eventually, I had loosened what I assume is the housing actually gripping onto the lens's zoom wheel, and I had to refind where each zoom was and kind of put pressure back on um, with the screws. Long story short, they're great lenses, but they are not tr like they're not true cinema lenses, they're just rehoused photography glass. So, you know, you're saving a lot of money, but you also have to be prepared for why you're saving money. I've since switched up, you know, the setup for all of the power, um, you know, cause now I have power going to the Teradek from a P-Tap, the monitor to a P-Tap, the camera to a P-Tap, and then the um, focus motor to a P-Tap. Um, so I need four banks. And then the other thing is by adding, you know, the focus and the Teradek and all this, and you're running to an external hard drive, you end up having a lot of cables. So cable management became important. Um, and I found that my favorite thing to use are Spriggs. So um, I use Spriggs as an AC. I used Spriggs on all those shoots that I was on where I was a cinematographer, the ACs love Spriggs. I think they're great. They're these little cable management um, eyelets, I guess, hooked eyelets. And they push into quarter 20, or you can get three eighths and they can push into three eighths screw holes. Um, and then they can hold on to cables. I think they're awesome. I currently have three on this rig. Um, keeps all the cables pretty tidy. But yeah, this is, this is the rig and I absolutely love it. I think, I think <laughs> that this is final compared to the last one. I don't think I'd be changing it much. Big changes really were that, you know, I just don't use the flexibility of moving from this rig to a gimbal, to the slider, etc. Generally, I just keep it like this. It's gonna be on a tripod. Then it's gonna get, you know, it's gonna get a, um, frog clamp, like a 3 8 eye, eye, eyelet up top, 
and a frog clamp for an easy rig. And I'm gonna go handheld. Um, those are, that's kind of how I shoot now. Or it's gonna go on like a Dana dolly. Um, but if you're on a Dana dolly, as opposed to a slider, weight is not as much of an issue. So you can keep it rigged out. Um, and it's just quicker that way for me. Um, but obviously you're using heavier stuff like Dana Dolly, so you probably are gonna want a, an assistant. Um, but we're kind of at that point now, so it works out. Um, but yeah, otherwise the rig is generally the same. You could still break this down and mount it on a gimbal. That's the great thing about the Pocket 6Ks. If you wanted to, you could still pretty quickly take this apart. Um, I just don't. And like I said, I'm gonna use another camera at that point. I understand that not everybody has that luxury um, yet. I think a lot of people will get there eventually. Um, but I just, you know, I don't even use a gimbal, so it really doesn't matter to me. So that's the rig. If there's any components on here that you would like me to go into more detail, um, I know there's information for all these parts out there on YouTube, so you can totally find it if you're searching for it. But if you want my personal opinion on it and you want me to go into more detail on any piece of this, um, I can make a video for that and explain how I use it or why I like it or what I don't like about it. Um, just let me know in the comments below. I'm pretty bad at knowing the overall price at this point, um, but with the Teradex and the Nano, I'm, I'm sure that this rig has increased probably double the price of what the old one was. Um, but you know, you can find out how much everything would cost if you Google it, and I'll include links to things in the description below. I'm also looking into doing maybe some more tips and kind of conversational bits. Conversational bits being talking about my experience shooting my first feature, talking about my experience on documentary shoots um, and also just kind of those tips for you know what I've learned running a video production business um, what I've learned in terms of pricing and client acquisition if you guys are curious about that stuff those videos are gonna be even easier for me to make because I can just sit here and talk I don't know if you guys are interested in that if you are let me know in the comments and I'll look into doing those videos um, again uh, full transparency, like I said, I've been working a lot, so I'm not gonna be pumping out videos like a typical YouTuber every week. Um, having said that, I'm gonna try and be responsive to you guys and um, be a good host, I suppose, when I post this information and try and post valuable information. So if you like that sort of a thing and you like what I'm doing here, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you guys interacting with me. I, I liked seeing views in the last video and, and having you guys actually have some input and questions um, and uh, subscribing to the channel, which was nice. So I look forward to uh, doing more of these videos and um, seeing you guys out there in the field.